Welcome to ACS Webinars, bringing you the best and brightest minds in chemistry live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. To view our upcoming schedule, please visit acs.org slash acswebinars. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Chemistry of Scent and Fragrance, which is being presented by the ACS Younger Chemist Committee, ACS Careers, and ACS Webinars. Right now, over 90 different local sections, student groups, and YCC groups are tuning in from across the country to join this broadcast. Get ready to explore the history and the chemistry of fragrance and find answers to your questions. Type any questions that you may have into the question box on your screen, and I'll relay them to our speakers. We also want to thank ACS President-Elect Dr. Diane Grobes-Smith and her colleagues at Procter & Gamble for volunteering to present today's program. Additionally, P&G has donated the blotters and fragrances that were included in your box. Now we're going to uh, hear from Dr. Smith, who will introduce our speakers and our program. Diane? Good evening, everyone. My name is Diane Schmidt, and I'm delighted that you can join us today for this webinar on the chemistry of scent and fragrance. Why do you get a warm and fuzzy feeling and remember being in your mother's kitchen when you smell that apple pie or perhaps it's chocolate chip cookies? Do smelling certain fragrances remind you of a loved one or perhaps even a specific period in your life? Our sense of smell plays an important role in how we perceive the world. One whiff of a simple chemical compound can bring back a memory from years ago or even adjust our mood. It can also cause us to choose one product over another. And scents, like language, can mean different things in different cultures. Today, chemists are working to unlock the secrets of scents making products that we use every day more enticing, more appetizing, and more attractive. We have made many advances in chemistry, but ultimately the best analytical instrumentation still cannot compete with our noses. Tonight, we will stimulate your minds and your noses. To help us make some sense of sense, I would like to present two scientists from Procter & Gamble who will walk you through the history, the art and palette, and then the science and chemistry of fragrance. We will first hear from Virginia Jenny Hutchins. Jenny is a professional perfumer who will share the history of mankind's use of perfumes and how perfumes are made today. We will then delve into the analysis of perfumes and odors with Dr. Jan June Lee, who is a principal scientist at Procter & Gamble. With their presentations combined, I guarantee that you will walk away with a better understanding of perfumery. With that, I'll turn the floor over to Jenny. Jenny, please whiff us away. Thanks, Diane. Well, I'll be talking to you all tonight about Perfume 101, an introduction to the of perfume. And I'd like to just say that while this talk is more focused on the art of perfume, there is a lot of science and chemistry behind this work as well. And you'll get to hear a little bit more about that from Jen, Jen later on. We will cover a very brief history of perfumes. We'll get you grounded on the perfumer's palette. What do we use exactly to make perfumes? And then finally, we'll talk about how do we create perfumes for certain products and how do we make them work in those products. Back in ancient times, perfume was used for religious purposes. Back as far as 1700 BC, the Bible makes specific references to aromatic materials like spices, balm, and myrrh. During the Middle Ages, Europe saw the first introduction of perfumes during the time of the Crusades. In the 16th century, the practice of perfuming gloves was very popular, and perfumes were also used to cover up body odors and bad smells in general due to the consumer habits and practices of that day. France quickly became the center for perfume manufacture. Towards the end of the 17th century, the first eau de cologne was created. And an eau de cologne is basically a classic blend of citrus oils with lavender or rosemary. In the 19th century, um, 
there was an exciting time for perfumery. Through organic synthesis, many new chemicals were discovered and added to the perfumer's palette. The bottle that you see on the lower left-hand corner of the screen, Chalamar by Guerlain, was the first fragrance to use ethyl vanillin, a synthetic material that has a vanilla-like odor. In 1921, we saw the creation of Chanel No. 5 using never-before-seen liberal amounts of aldehydes, in aldehydes in particular desyl and desilenic and lauric. These are powerful aroma chemicals that really help enhance a fragrance. In the 80s, we saw a lot of bold and extroverted fragrances, scents like Giorgio, Poison, Beautiful, and Obsession, some of you may know or may remember. In the 90s, we kind of turned the corner towards more sheer and transparent themes. And I would say in the last decade, it's kind of a return to classics. So while we still see the influence of some of these sheer and transparent fragrances, we're seeing basically classics being reinvented. Just a few terms to get you grounded that you may hear when we're talking about perfumery. A concrete is a waxy solid that is obtained from petty extraction of non-resinous or low-resinous natural raw materials. An absolute, which many of you may have heard, is basically obtained from the concrete, from alcohol extraction. And an essential oil is a volatile material that is obtained through steam distillation. Resins and balsams are natural raw materials that are collected from trees and plants through solvent extraction or distillation. Examples are oat moss, olibanum, or labdanum, basically viscous resins that come from trees or shrubs. Aroma chemicals are really the workhorses today for the perfumer. These are materials which are derived from either natural sources or usually produced by organic synthesis. For instance, benzyl acetate, that first molecule that you see on the left, is a main constituent of jasmine absolute. Phenyl ethyl alcohol, the one on the right, is a main component of rose oil. Aldehydes, which I mentioned earlier, are highly fragrant, very powerful chemicals that provide lift to a fragrance. And sometimes you'll hear that even chain aldehydes, for instance, desyl aldehyde, is a very citrusy note. And odd chain aldehydes smell more soapy, clean, aldehydic. As you can see, the perfumer has a lot of materials at their disposal to create a perfume. And as the perfumer begins their training, we basically start with, with the odor families. And this is a way of how we classify raw material odors. So you see some of these families on the screen there, citrus, aromatic, leather, etc. It is important to note that within each family, there are very many nuances and vectors that one can go. For instance, in the green family, the term green can mean many things. You can think of cut grass as green, or a spicy pepper as green, a violet green, a watery green. So there are very many different avenues which you can go, and a perfumer has to learn all of those materials and learn how to put them together to make one cohesive scent. So after years of training on odor with families, we move on to finished fragrances or fine fragrance families. These on the screen are some of the fine fragrance families that you may hear of. For instance, a citrus fine fragrance is a fragrance based primarily on fresh citrus top notes. I've given examples for each family, CK1 by Calvin Klein, Clinique Happy. A floral fragrance is one where the dominant is, note is floral, and it can be a singular floral or it can be a complex blend of florals. So all those that you see there are, I would say, variations on a rose. Tresor is kind of a peachy rose. Stella McCartney is kind of an ambery rose. J'adore is uh, a rose with berry note to it. An oriental fragrance is one that is rich in base notes of vanilla, balsams, amber, patchouli, sandalwood, and musk, basically all the heavy materials. So I mentioned Shalimar earlier, um, the first one to use ethyl vanillin, and I'm sure many of you know Angel. It's got a chocolatey and patchouli note, which is can be polarizing. You either love it or you hate it.
Chipra refers to a fragrance that is built around a classical combination of bergamot, oak moss, labdanum, woody patchouli, and animalic notes. So when I think of chipras, I think of kind of old-fashioned, very heavy smelling perfumes. Aromatics of Elixir by Clinique is one that comes to mind. Coco Mademoiselle in recent years by Chanel, I would say, is a modern chipra, and it's been made modern by the incorporation of cleaner, fruity notes. A fougere is a fragrance that is built on a traditional masculine base, comprising of lavender, oak moss, coumarin, and a citrus note on top. So, for instance, cold water and dracon noir, which you may know, they are all fougeres. Basically, a lot of men's fragrances are fougeres. So now we'll talk about how do we create perfumes. I would say that the first part has to do a lot with the art of perfume design. How do we know what to create? And basically, we find inspiration through trends, through the everyday world. We may decide we want to build a fragrance around a certain food note, or perhaps a new ingredient that's been discovered. Really, inspiration can come from anywhere. And there are a multitude of directions and styles in designing and refining a fragrance idea, because there are thousands of materials to choose from. There isn't just one single way to make a rose. A rose can have different nuances. It could be a little bit more citrusy, a little bit more green, a little bit more spicy. So every perfumer's got their own little touch as far as the, the kind of perfumes that they, they create. And then lastly, there are analytical tools that we can use for perfume formulation, and Junjun will be talking more in detail about this. The second part of perfume design is technical design. How do you put it together? And basically, every material has a certain odor and, and a note that determines how it will perform in the finished perfume. And it's characterized by its volatility, either as a top, middle, or base note. A good perfume should consist of a balanced blend of top, middle, and base notes, arranged in a way that creates a nice, balanced accord. You may have seen this before. Um, this is an example of a fragrance triangle, and it basically describes a fragrance in terms of the volatility of the materials in the formulation. So on top, you have your fresh, green, fruity top notes. In the middle, you have your floral mid notes, and then the sandalwood, amber, musk, vanilla are considered base notes. These are the things that are going to last on your skin and on your hair. So, for example, this is a very typical perfume triangle for a, a shampoo perfume. These triangles will look different depending on the product application that you're designing the perfume for. So, along with the technical design, this means optimizing the fragrance and product for stability, odor, and color, making sure that it displays right out of the base and it doesn't turn your product yellow or whatever color that you don't want. Delivering the right in-use experience and scent profile. For instance, air care devices, the scents have to have enough power to fill an entire room or whatever space that you're putting the device in. There's also additional considerations, such as using perfume delivery technologies to enhance the consumer experience. And the last thought that I will leave you with is that perfume development is an iterative process. I've heard it said that 99% of the perfumes that a perfumer makes in their career will never make it to the shelf. And once you've gotten the inspiration and you're creating it's a continuous character development reloop, working with evaluators to refine the character, getting feedback from consumers as to whether or not they like it. And then finally, eventually, hopefully, the perfume gets qualified and goes into market. And now I will turn it over to Jun Jun. Thanks, Jenny. And we'll talk about why do we do perfume and auto analysis? and what are the analytical strategies and approaches in sampling the fragrance and the odor. And also talk about the detection methods and the techniques and tools used for analysis. And I will end with the application examples of uh, the analysis. Why do we do perfume and odor analysis? Or you might ask differently, what contributions do analytical chemists make? As Ginny just mentioned, a fragrance, they smell great, but they're not just for aesthetics. They actually, it's a key active ingredient. And it drives overall acceptance of a product 
and reinforces key benefits like a clean shirt and, and you expect a certain smell. And when it's a healthy hair, you expect a certain smell. So those are one, number one reason. So we want to do perfume and odor analysis. And also too, we want to really ensure and we are delighting the consumers at the key different use stages. And when you think of a buying a product on the store shelf, and then you open it to use it, and after use it, every step, we would like to make sure that odor is smelled right and meets your expectations or exceed your expectations. To continue, why we do analysis, and Ginny mentioned about the off color, but off odor is another problem too. We want to prevent that to happen because it can lead to high numbers of consumer complaints, lost business. So that's a no-no. We want to prevent that. And also too, is to bring a scientific approach and understanding of perfume and odor. And Ginny mentioned to you, and they got a lot of inspirations from nature, from beauty, from design, and we can really help it's to analyze what are the things it's new, and they gave this back to the perfumers to help to create new fragrances. So now I'd like to touch on when we do perfume odor analysis, what's the strategy? Now uh, really the number one is what's the analysis objective and what question needs to be answered. So if you try to find what's the nice smell when you just open the bottle, or you really want to extend that scent, what's at the end of the day smell like? So the analysis objective is the first question you need to think through, but that really changed how you design to uh, do the analysis. The perfume odor analysis is different from just a common composition analysis because we are focusing on the sensory relevance and significance components. And the biggest peak when you do gas chromatography may not be the biggest contributor at all. It's actually that peak you may not be even able to see. As Diane mentioned at the beginning, sometimes our nose still is the best detector. And although we made progresses, um, but I think still when you do odor analysis, we want to sensory relevance and significant components. And the process of doing perfume odor analysis, and it's roughly we can break it into a four key categories. And really sampling the odor is the key one because you need to capture what's the smell. So you need to really think, okay, it's in under what conditions you are smelling, what scenarios, or what conditions. So sampling the air, and this is where you can really use your creativity, and you need to capture that odor. And once you capture the odor, and you're familiar with gas chromatography, that's where the mixture of the volatile mixture or the semi-volatile mixtures can be separated into different components. Once you separate in the end, then you have the detectors. We have the different instrumental detectors and of course the human nose. As I mentioned, for odor analysis, it's very important we have the human nose in there. And in the end, it's data analysis. How to put things together, how to interpret the data, it's also one of the most important steps. As I mentioned, sampling approaches, it's, it's the one of the most important things for odor analysis. And in the key areas, we can say it's four or five areas we can describe. And aesthetic headspace, you can, you can think of the bottle on the, on the left. In there, it's just a headspace above the solution or above the sample. And if you can smell that one, you maybe simply just take a volume of that headspace and inject into the GC to do analysis. And for that, it's, it's very simple, it's rapid, and, but it's a sensitivity. It, it, it may not be enough, so you need to be able to smell it to be to, to, to do analysis. If it's a very faint smell, and or for example in the room, or, or it's on your skin, and then you need to think of other methods, like dynamic headspace, which you can use a gas to poach it, and then concentrate, which I will give more examples in the next few slides. And the next one is equilibrium methods. In here we have the SPEMI, or start phase micro extraction on the up right hand corner. In there it's actually a needle, it's like a, a syringe, but it have a retractable needle. And when that needle is exposed, it has a polymer face. And that is like a perfume odor sponge. So when you expose that needle wherever the odor is, and then that will absorb to the fiber, then you can inject that directly onto the GC. And that's very popular for analysis. 
It's similar category of the group of method. It's called the twist bar. Basically, the same idea, but use a, a steel bar. It's coated with a much thicker polymer face. It's like a stationary face that can absorb the odor. Then, because the twist bar, you can put it into different places, as you will see examples in the next few slides, to sample that odor. The next two slides is really about dynamic headspace or poaching trap because those are really the most common used analysis. You just pump the air off the, the way you smell it and through a trap. And in the trap, it's the volatiles are collected because you're only pushing the air through and there is no distortion of what's in the air. So it's an accurate profile of the volatiles. And of course, dynamic range can be a problem if sometimes if we have a component, it, it's, it's very uh, much of the headspace and that will be very concentrated and at very hot, large peak and so you, you may have an issue but if you can always solve problems uh, just for example select with this over it. Uh, automation not entirely straightforward but great advance has been made by instrumentation manufacturers and now actually there is automated instrumentation for dynamic headspace. This is another example of doing dynamic space or poaching trap. You can put your samples in the jars as you can design. You always have an inert gas to in and then poach the headspace out and then trap it. And you can use for all kinds of things listed on this screen. This is the last example about sampling. The imagination really is the limitation of different ways to sample. You want to sample an aroma when you're eating food. And this is a device, it's been published and it's been used in, in the company to sample the flavor it's released. So you have all kinds of factors in here when you hydrate, when you chew in it, your breathing and temperature control and everything else, you can generate that aroma and then trap and then for analysis. This is another a few pictures of you do a real sampling in outside the door or at consumer homes or in situ. And as you can see, this is using the, the different uh, techniques I mentioned to you and to do in situ sampling. Once we get the samples collected, that's the number one step. Then you need to dissolve it. Once you dissolve it, you maybe need to concentrate with the cryotrap in there and then go through the GC, separate into different components. Once it's separated, of course, then you can use the, the massa spectral detector, the MSD in there for chemical identity and of course if this knows and then the FID for concentration. In the upper right corner you can see a few of the actually the sniff port and you can have one or two sniff ports and record in your comments while you're sniffing. The cycle physics is really important because some components it really have a high ODT the ODT is a concentration above that threshold you can smell it. And they all have this S code showing in the graph on to the left. And the different components, the group of components showing some have high ODT and some have low ODT components. For all perfume and odor components, they all have incredibly low ODT and very low concentration you can smell it. And that's the why sometimes we have instrumentation uh, challenges to actually record it. And here's just showing an example after doing the analysis. Uh, we, as we said, we have the different detectors and the red trace. It's the sniff port, we call the aroma gram. That's when you smell something, you can push a button to record, okay, what did you smell? You can record your, your saying it or actually you have uh, panels to say what, what did you smell. And then have the mass spectrum showing in the right up corner that show you we can really see what's the identity. And then we have the trace, it's the FID, that's the concentration profile. What is in there, it's identity, it's concentration, and what's the odor significance. This slide should show you a few quick screening tools. And if for sometimes if we know a specific odor needs to be monitored and this are all the different tools we can use from the chemical sensor to the photo ionization detector, the drug tubes, the electronic nose or the metal oxide sensors and the xenos uh, which is a fresh TC. So you can get all kinds of different screening tools to help with the analysis when you know exactly what you are monitoring that's for known components. 
once we get all the analysis done, what's the use? And we can really use for perfume optimization. As we said, it's the different matrix or the different stages you want the perfume to be expressed. You can use this to really optimize the perfumes. Now, is it contributing? Is it not contributing? And you said to get inspiration to the perfumers, we need to end up what's the trend. And it's important too for industry also the competitive understanding. Now, formulation models and design guidance and different products have very different interactions with your perfume. The same perfume into different products will smell totally different. So how to understand and optimize design the fragrance for the product? It's extremely important and that's the main use of the analysis tools. And as I mentioned, the offer the mail the resolution, what is it, how to eliminate it. And also too, it's become very important to have intellectual properties. And really when you have a nice odor, it's a perfume delivery system working for the products and IP can protect uh, the technology. And perfume-based compatibility and delivery technology I mentioned to you about perfume microcapsules and the different delivery technologies. And the last but not least is it's quality insurance and specifications. We want to make sure ensure the products smell exactly the same and as you expect it or exceeds your expectation. And Analytical can help to, to deliver that. Thank you for watching this presentation. ACS Webinars is provided as a service of the American Chemical Society as your chemistry source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.